Welcome to Coming Home Well. I'm your guest host, Liz Booker, a retired Coast Guard helicopter pilot and writer on a mission to influence the demographics of aviation through story. As literary aviatrix, I have built a community of readers and writers around books featuring women in aviation and have interviewed authors about their books and their writing and publishing journeys. A large portion of these stories reflect the ways in which aviation history is indelibly linked to military history. This interview is a rebroadcast of the Aviatrix Book Review podcast in collaboration with Coming Home Well. While my interviews span the diversity of aviation experiences, I hope the ones that are featured here will educate and inspire those who listen. These are human stories of grit and courage, failure and success, that happen to be about women in military aviation from around the world throughout our history. And welcome. I'm Liz Booker, and I am thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with the author of the Aviatrix Book Club Helicopter Heroine, Valerie Andre, surgeon, pioneering rescue pilot, and her courage under fire. Charles Morgan Evans, welcome. Well, thank you, Liz. I'm so thrilled about this book. I can't even tell you how excited I was when I first saw it pop up on Amazon. I kind of troll there regularly looking for new books. I was so excited to see this one, and it did not disappoint when I finally got to read it. What an incredible woman that you wrote about. Can you give us a synopsis of the book for anyone who hasn't had a chance to read it? All right. Well, Valerie Andre was born in 1922 in Strasbourg, France. And at a very early age, I think she was 10 at the time, in around 1932, she encountered a French aviator named Maurice Hiltz. And Maurice Hiltz was known for setting record flights. Uh, she, I think she flew from Paris to Saigon, Vietnam in 1931. And so when Maurice Hiltz came to Strasbourg Aerodrome in 1932, and Valerie Andre was there, a 10-year-old girl, clutching a bouquet of flowers to present to her, she was hooked on aviation for life. She had it in her mind to become two things, one, a pilot, and the other thing, eventually, as she matured, she wanted to become a doctor. And those were ambitions that her family both encouraged and discouraged at the same time. Her family was a very progressive family for its time. Her father was an instructor at a school in Strasbourg. Her mother had artistic ambitions, and but they did encourage their children to be very independent. And I think that's what Valerie Andre took on at a very early age, this independence. She was determined when she got to the age of about 16, 17, she was determined to become a pilot. And she said at the time that boys were, were allowed to take flight training lessons for civil defense. The war was coming. They knew that there was something going to be happening with Germany eventually. And uh, but she had to raise money by giving lessons, tutoring and different things like math and other aspects of study that she was good at. And so she raised money, took flight lessons at just in August of 1939, just in time for the war to break out in September in 1939. And so her ambitions were for flight were put on hold for the time being. But the other ambition was to become a doctor and she eventually had to follow that ambition and really surreptitiously during this, this time period. Her, she wanted to go to the University of Strasbourg, but the University of Strasbourg in 1940 was co-opted by the Germans after the occupation of France. And so a lot of the faculty and students actually left Strasbourg, left Alsace-Lorraine, the region that the Germans considered a forbidden zone, and she had to travel to a place called Clermont-Ferrand to continue her education. However, that place was raided by the Gestapo in 1942, I believe. And after that, she had to live underground from 1942 until the liberation of Paris. She went to Paris to study at the Sorbonne. And she had to live underground, basically, under threat of arrest for the duration of the war, or actually the duration of the occupation in France. Incredible life to start with. 
But when she was in Paris, actually, when the Free French Army entered in, in August of 1944 for the liberation, and she was actually in the square of Notre Dame Cathedral to listen to Charles de Gaulle give his famous speech declaring the liberation of Paris. Paris is free once again. And she was enamored by the Free French soldiers who came in to liberate the city. And she called them modern day knights. She was, that's what, that was her characterization of the Free French under General Leclerc and de Gaulle. She thought that they were modern day knights. And so when she graduated with a medical degree in 1947, she was encouraged to enlist in the French army. And the, at the time, the French army was involved in a colonial war. Basically, this is what you would have to call it in Vietnam. The whole region was called Indochina under the French, which was Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. But uh, there was a highly nationalistic independence movement, movement led by Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. And uh, the Vietnamese under Ho Chi Minh wanted independence from France. But France was broke after World War II. After four years of occupation by the Germans, they needed the resources of all their colonies. It was not just Southeast Asia, but North Africa as well, and other parts of the world that they had colonies. And so it was, it's a thing that I don't really promote the aspect of this war as being a good thing. I understand the French position, but I also understand the Vietnamese desire to become independent. But what I, but I, what I emphasize in this book is that Valerie Andre was a force for good. She went there with the idea of helping out not just the French soldiers, but also the allied colonial soldiers that fought along the French and also the enemy Viet Minh when they had to be treated as well. She started out in a military hospital in Saigon where she didn't have the background to be a surgeon, but they needed surgeons. And so a master neurosurgeon taught her the intricacies of performing neurosurgery because of all the tremendous head trauma cases that were coming into the hospital at that time, she would actually have to perform when she became proficient in neurosurgery, she would sometimes have to perform as many as 100 interventions a month. So an incredible amount of workload that she had at that time. But another thing came along a few years later, she was she arrived in Vietnam in 19, late 1947. She re-upped for another tour of duty, I think, in 1950. And I have to emphasize one thing about Vietnam at this time. The French did not have a draft. Let me back that up. The French had conscription for mandatory service. However, it was voluntary to go to Vietnam. If you were a French, if you're a soldier in the French army, the French military at that time, you could remain in France or one of the colonies at that time. Going to Vietnam and being a participant in the Vietnam War that the French were conducting at the time, the Indochina War, was strictly voluntary. So everybody who was in Vietnam at that time was there on a volunteer basis. But in 1950, something interesting happened. An Englishman by the name of Alan Bristow was trying to sell a helicopter for a French distributor of Hiller's. Hiller Helicopter was a company that I know really well because I was a curator at the Hiller Museum and I worked for Stanley Hiller. And Hiller was a company based in Palo Alto, California. And one of the first, well, the pioneer, one of the first pioneers, one of the first four companies to successfully build and market a helicopter back in the late 1940s. Bell, Sikorsky, and Piasecki being the other three. But this Englishman named Bristow had an interesting background. I think I, may, I make mention of it in the book, but he landed in Vietnam with the idea of trying to sell a Hiller helicopter for medical rescue purposes to the French Air Force. And he demonstrated the helicopter in Saigon, and Valerie Andre was there to see it fly for the first time. And you have to remember, she was always enamored with the idea of becoming a pilot. And so when she saw this thing fly for the first time, she was hooked. She thought that she was be, she would be perfect as a candidate to fly a helicopter in this fledgling ser service. She said two things. She had medical training background. She was a surgeon. And the other thing was that she was a very petite, very lightweight. She weighed probably a little bit under 100 pounds at the time. And she said that the helicopters, she knew, because she, she would obviously ask a lot of questions, she said that they were their payload capacity was so limited they could only take a pilot and two wounded two wounded soldiers on litters on stretchers on the side of the helicopter at best with with a male pilot a normal weight male pilot and so she reckoned that because of her light weight there would be a possibility of taking three wounded passengers along with her instead of just the two with a male pilot and so she made that argument and surprisingly she was able to get through with it 
because she experienced tremendous amount of prejudice at the time being a woman, not only wanting to become a pilot, but there was prejudice even as, as a doctor in, in military hospitals, even though doctors were at an incredible shortage at the time. Yeah. And she did it, right? She did it. She had support by the first pilot for the French Air Force. Prior to this, there were aerial medical rescue. It was all done with fixed wing aircraft that had to have a runway in order to take off. And often it meant that the French, you have to imagine, they were scattered all over Vietnam. They had these outposts that sometimes had between 30 and maybe 100 men, depending on how big these outposts were. And they were scattered all throughout various parts of Vietnam at the time. And so with fixed wing aircraft, you had to have a runway nearby. And that required sometimes transporting a severely wounded soldier, maybe 20, 30 kilometers or more to get to a area where an airplane could land and take off. These were just fixed wings that could only take one uh, wounded passenger at a time. And so the helicopter was a revelation. The hel helicopter could actually come into these remote outposts and land quickly because they were almost always under enemy fire by the Viet Minh, the enemy that the, the French were fighting under Ho Chi Minh. And uh, they had to be able to come in quickly and take off. Well, the first pilot for the French Air Force was a man named Alexis saint -Denis. And Alexis saint has a really illustrious history as well. He was with the French Air Force since 1939. He was decommissioned during the occupation and he joined the resistance in, during the Second World War and actually helped in the liberation of Grenoble, France in 1944 under, when he, in his resistance cell. But after the war, he re-enlisted in the, in the Air Force and flew a lot of fixed wing missions, but became France's first helicopter pilot in 1950, 51. He went back to Paris, France to take flight training lessons and returned and for a while flew solo missions and then added another pilot who lasted for a while until a Jeep accident forced him to go home. And then Valerie Andre came along and he was skeptical, but he knew by meeting her that she was determined and she had ability and he accepted her. He basically said to her that if you can show me, you can do the work and you can demonstrate your capability, then we'll see how it goes. And it was never easy for Valerie Andre. She always had to find acceptance all the way through. There was no easy route for her every step of the way. As I said, even in the military hospitals, she was looked at sometimes skeptically, even though she had the rank of captain, I must emphasize that when she was commissioned in the French army in 1947, in the French medical corps, she was commissioned as captain, but even on, with the officers of equal rank, she was often treated pretty poorly. In fact, when she arrived in Vietnam, she was given poor quarters until uh, actually her uh, university professor, a guy named Leon Bonnet, came to visit Vietnam and saw how she was being treated, how her living quarters were really deplorable and uh, insisted that she would be treated better. But uh, she was gutsy all the way through in her life. And uh, as, as I've told you, this, she's still with us. She just turned 101. It's incredible. That is just incredible. And what a joy for you to get to go over there. Oh, there's so much, so much more to the book even, but so much that you've already said that I just want to touch on. First and foremost is this sort of history of Indochina. I've said this a few times in my interviews that I studied some history, especially like Naval War College type of stuff for my military career. And as someone who was operating in the Caribbean, and especially with Haitian and Cuban migrants, I really wanted to understand the politics behind the policies that I was enforcing. So I did study that history. But otherwise, I really have never been somebody who's deeply interested in history. And having the opportunity to read to see, especially obviously, the history of the last century through the lens of women, through this project and reading books about women in aviation, I now can connect with it in ways that I might not have otherwise. And so that was wonderful about this book. You cover a period of time, a period of history that I really hadn't had access to before the pre-US intervention in Vietnam and the post-World War II, because we do read a lot about the women who flew during World War II and what was going on with other countries. That is a gift to us in itself. Obviously, her story is so incredible. And then I also just wanted to say, I think I read like one critique of the book saying, well, we don't talk about Valerie's 
conscience basically over how she what she was contributing to and why and listen as a former coast guard helicopter pilot i had to do a lot of things the easiest one to justify is go out and rescue somebody who's in danger however i was also doing a lot of migrant interdictions i was also doing a lot of drug interdictions and so On the day to day, I felt like the things that I was doing in the immediately in the immediate moment were righteous and I was well trained for them and they were important. And I wasn't thinking at the time about the major geopolitics that created the situation that I was in. So I think I can get past Valerie <laughs> being oh, a part of that because everything that she did there was so righteous. It was. That, yeah. That is absolutely true. Yeah. Even in, she was out. One thing I didn't mention was that she was also part of an airborne medical unit that was parachuted into remote areas before the helicopter arrived in 1950. And one time she was actually parachuted into Laos, where the French were also maintaining outposts. And Mm -hmm. when she was there, she not only treated, she treated not only the French soldiers, but also native population. She actually had to I think extract teeth and for some people that were, yeah. that came up to her from the, the villages that surrounded these outposts. And uh, there were often times in her career in Vietnam where she actually had to treat Viet Minh and protect mm-hmm. them from being harmed by soldiers that just lost their comrades or buddies in in combat. Mm-hmm. And she was she always she said she didn't she was a true doctor and uh, she made no distinction of who she treated based on their political affiliations, their race. They were all equal in her eyes, and they always were. Yeah, and here's another little thing I'll add, is that as a search and rescue pilot, I was just really fascinated with the fact that she was both a doctor and a pilot because... I am someone who really doesn't have the stomach for, in fact, reading some of the descriptions that you gave us of brain surgery, I had to look away. (laughs) I always used to say when I was flying, I don't look back. That's not my business back there. I just fly the plane. So the fact that she did both and did both well is just so heroic and impressive. And the fact that she did it in the time frame, in the period of history that she was doing it under the conditions that she was doing it. We did have a doctor on the book club discussion last night, and I asked, huh? did you cringe as a doctor in the way that we helicopter pilots cringed at the fact that she was taking these very primitive aircraft off in high density altitude situations, overloaded, trying to get them airborne? So many things could have gone wrong. So many things did go wrong. And she's just out there trying to make it work and survived all that. That's miraculous. The doctor oh, said, is. yeah. And the doctor said it's battlefield medicine. And so it's always going to be, you're always adapting, but clearly more prim- primitive than they would have today. True. I think it set the precedent. It set the basis for medical rescue a- as it has evolved over the decades for today. But back then it was just, everything was improvised. Right. Everything was a new experience. You didn't have a book or any history to rely on. You had to, you made it up as you went along. Yeah. She talks about how they, how one pilot who, an early pilot had to perform a rescue of a downed fighter pilot. His airplane crashed into mm-hmm. a, into one of the, part of the Delta region, one of the marshes in, the, in, in South Vietnam. And he survived the crash, but he, but a pilot had to go out there and actually just improvise how he was pulled out of a marshy swamp while he was hiding from the Viet Minh or fight, hiding from anybody who might capture him or wind up shooting him. And she, so afterwards they practiced with a rope dangling from the helicopter with her at the bottom to see if she could be rescued. And she gives a very graphic description about how that went. But as I said, it was total improvisation. Everything that they did at that time, they were making up as they went along because there was actually nothing really. There were a few helicopter rescues, early helicopter rescues, but I would say the French, along with the Americans in Vietnam, were the ones, excuse me, the Americans in Korea, at the same time, were the ones that really wrote the book on the basics of helicopter, medical helicopter rescue. And the foundation of everything that I trained in is very standardized today, at least in the Coast Guard. Yeah, it's incredible to read that history and to see how they navigated that. You mentioned your own history of being the founding curator at Hiller Museum, which is in San Carlos, California. Is that right? That's about 25 miles from San Francisco, down south from San yeah, Francisco. Yeah. Uh, I'm familiar. I lived in Mountain View. I was stationed at SFO. Ah. So I spent some time in that area. I'm so curious to know your path to that position and what that journey looked like and then how that led you to Valerie. It was a crazy story. I was going to San Francisco State at the time doing a master's degree in history. 
<clears throat> and I was living in Redwood City, which is really close to Redwood City was where the museum started. It, it was the location in San Carlos is the current location. But the story was I had a friend who restored Morris Miners and nobody knows what a Morris Miner is, but it's an English Volkswagen. It was a similar car to the Volkswagen Beetle back in the 50s and 60s. And so my friend was a specialist in restoring these cars. And I, I and my brother actually bought a Morris Miner. So that's why I have this fascination with the car. But he, one day I visited his shop. He lived across the street from me, basically. And he had this model of a helicopter on a, And he said, I'm going to be building a replica of this helicopter. And it's for a museum run by Stanley Hiller. And I, at the time, I did not know who Stanley Hiller was. I prided myself at the time, I was in my 20s, knowing quite a bit about transportation. I was a gearhead for cars and not so much with aviation because I didn't have access to it. But uh, so I asked, what museum? It's, oh, it's in Redwood City. And I'd never heard of it. Well, it's a private museum. Oh, okay. And he told me where it was and he told me who Stanley Hiller was. And I later found out if you were of a certain generation from the, from the Bay Area, if you grew up during the 1950s and 60s, then you would have likely heard of Stanley Hiller. I was born in 1963. So that was a, by 1965, I think Hiller had moved out of Palo Alto and had moved to Maryland. It was acquired by another company. It was acquired by, I'm trying to think of who it was at the moment. It'll come to me in a moment. But anyway, the point was that he, he was building this replica of a helicopter and I was going to San Francisco State. And at the time I was considering doing a kind of an internship for credit at the San Francisco Maritime the Museum I liked going to. But I thought to myself, maybe I should try writing to Stanley Hiller and seeing if, I, if there's a possibility I can get a part-time job and work with him. And it took me, I think, two or three letters to get to him eventually. And then I got to meet him. He had an office on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park. And so I went up to visit him. And I guess he liked what I, how I presented myself. And he hired me as his curator. And what he, when I got there finally to see the museum, it was crazy. It was in a really remote warehouse in Redwood City. You wouldn't know it was a museum at all from the outside. You just would have thought it was a generic warehouse. And when you got inside this place... There was wall-to-ceiling aircraft. I think at the time there were probably between 35 and 40 aircraft. I think we added about five to 10 of them. No, I know we did. Probably added about 10 aircraft while I was there. Oh. But there were at least 35 to 40 aircraft in this building, stacked from, from the ceiling, hung from the ceiling, uh, on the ground. Some were big, some were small. We had this one aircraft. It was a one-off helicopter built in 1953 by a company called Doman in Pennsylvania, we had another helicopter that was built, I think, in New Jersey by a company called Gazda. We had all these weird things that had been donated to the museum over the years. At the time, people didn't know what to do with these one-off aircraft that weren't going to fly. And so mm -hmm. they would sometimes call up Stanley Hiller. I think the story with one of them was that he was working as CEO of a company called York International. They make air conditioning products. And this helicopter was in Pennsylvania, this Dolman, one-off helicopter, just one of one ever built. And they said, do you want it? And he said, sure. And he paid for the transportation to have it shipped back to Redwood City, California. But getting back to my experience with, and how I got to know about Valerie Andre, on my first day at the museum, left alone just to go looking at this entire crazy collection, not just aircraft, but all sorts of photographs too. There was a photo of, here, it's on the cover of my book. This photo, I think, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Was a photo that I initially saw, and I just wondered what the story of that of the woman in, in the, the floppy hat was all about. <laughs> I didn't know that was Vietnam at the time. I just knew it was something interesting, and, there, and I had to ask more about it. And Stanley Hiller told me all he knew about her, he had met her a couple times. She had come to, he had gone to France and she had come to California. And he just told me that she was this medical rescue pilot, a doctor who flew these incredible missions. I later found out that she flew 168 missions in Vietnam and rescued 100, no, excuse me, 128 missions she flew in Vietnam and rescued 168 men. And I was just fascinated by the story. I just always kept it in my head. I wrote another book about 20 years ago called War of the Aeronauts, which was on Civil War balloon pilots. Yeah. And I thought at that time, I finally had enough experience under my belt to approach Valerie Andre. So I wrote a letter to her in France. So she lives in a place called Issy-le-Molyneux, which is right outside of Paris. 
And I thought that I, that with that, I could come and visit her and actually see if there's a possibility of maybe writing this book. And that was in 2003. Okay. So it's been a multi-year project. I, as I, I worked for Stanley Hiller, get back to that story. I worked for him for six years and okay. then I moved to Reno, Nevada, where I continued to work on writing. Okay. And as I said, I wrote this other book first and I thought by that, by now I have some experience and I can approach this project. And I thought it would be a lot easier than it wouldn't be uh, a 20 year experience at the time, but I didn't want to write anything derivative. I wanted to write something I hope was original and not just took in her experiences, Valerie Andre's experiences, but also took in the experiences of other people her life intersected with. As I mentioned, Alexis Santini was very important in her life. He not only approved of her, and allowed her. I use these words with caution because I know that those are, as they say, triggering words these days. But it was the military. Take... It was the 1950s, and it, and she's a woman. So you, you have to take we, we weren't going to do context. anything without permission. <laughs> you have so. to take it with the context of the situation yeah. and the era. They yeah. say she was allowed and had permission. That's the military, as you well know, that's the military yeah. tradition. That's the military way of doing things. And it's also the context of the time. A woman attempting to do this in 1950 France, even though it's in Vietnam, there are a lot of prejudices, a lot of chauvinism that is ex extent at that time. And so when I use these words, given permission, allowed to do things, it is really crucial to say that because it wasn't the, it wasn't the norm at the time. It really wasn't. And she, ha she broke a lot of barriers. And in her in way, she did it successfully and to show her capability actually opened the world up to other women to follow in her footsteps yeah. and made it easier and made it more, not of a matter of permission, a matter of showing ability, showing capability. I think that, and I think that's an important thing to emphasize with Valerie Andre. She never considered herself a feminist. She only, she really believed in being somebody who could demonstrate capability, the ability to do something correctly, <laughs> equal to anyone who can do the same job. Which yeah, is feminism, that, but that's, whether she considers her, herself to be one or not, that is feminism. <laughs> well, it is, but I think she believed in just equal and fair just, fair treatment for all. Whether you're a man, a woman, whether you're any race, religion, mm -hmm. I think that she just believed in. I think she just believes in fair treatment. Fair. Mm -hmm. And we had this discussion not too long ago when I was in in France last month. I was invited on her birthday to by her nephew, who's the mayor of Issy La Molino, her town to do a book presentation at the city hall on Valerie mm -hmm. Andre's birthday. We, we first went to visit Valerie Andre. She's in a retirement home, not too far from where she used to live, not too far from city hall in East La Malino. And we, we, we had a very nice time. It was only about a dozen people that were there for her birthday because she's 101 and it, they didn't want to make too big a thing. But I was quite honored because they considered me part of what they call an inner circle of people and friends and family who get, get who have known her for all these years and they include me in that group and i find that to be a, quite a bit of an honor and a privilege to be allowed in that little group Absolutely. and so her stepson was there that's the son of alexi santini and i must have, I have to mention that the first pilot i mentioned alexi santini eventually became her husband in 1963 they'd known each other for more than probably by that time 13 years and Alexei had been married before, but his wife died shortly after his, his son was born in 1941, I believe. And so he was a widower and he uh, shared experiences with Valerie Andre. And so they married in 1963 and he lived, I think, until 1997, 1998. I think that's about yeah. right. But uh, but it was quite nice. His Alexei Santini's son was there. The mayor of Isi La Malignu, Valerie's nephew was there, Valerie's granddaughter was there, and other friends were there. And it was quite nice. And afterwards, as I said, we had a, what they call a roundtable discussion at City Hall with about 100 people there. And I was able to present my book. And a very good friend of mine, uh, Martine Gay, she presented her book. This is by Martine Gay. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, see, I went looking for this after you mentioned it in the email. And so I'll have to see if I can, if you can connect me with a place where people can buy that book. Okay. I can do that because I think it's a very good book. We're, it's, we're, our, I think both our books are very complementary to each other. I wrote a fairly extensive book about Valerie Andre based on her recollections of the, of her life. But I also, as I said, intersected her life with other people. And I gave as much background as I could, like to Alexis Santini 
and to other pilots like Raymond Fumat, uh, Henri Bartier, who I mentioned. And uh, there are many other pilots who served in Vietnam during this period, but those were the core that made up the original uh, pioneers of medical hel helicopter rescue in Vietnam for the French. But Martin Gay's book actually emphasizes a lot of uh, the family life of Valerie Andre that I would have liked to have been able to include in my own book, but I think she did a really good job. So I think our books are very complementary to each other. Oh, that's good to know. That's really good to know. Do you know if it's translated into English anywhere? No, uh, no. <laughs> it's, not, it's not. What do you sense, or did you have any opportunity to talk to anybody who's like in leadership today in the army and hear from them, like what they consider Valerie's legacy to be to the service? Oh, Tremendous. I have talked to a number of her colleagues over the years, and she's held in the highest regard. And one of the things that I mentioned in her post-war career is how she was instrumental in bringing more, more women into the, into the French military medical corps. Yeah. The, when she was admitted in 1947, it was because there were shortages of medical personnel and they needed anyone. But in the 1960s, that kind of laxed. And they were more inclined, again, the chauvinistic approach in the military was to admit men into the military medical corps. And she thought that, again, this is not, she didn't regard this as a feminist thing. She regarded, she regarded this as a, more of a, a just cause because she, she put, made this argument when they had entrance exams, there were women who were scoring higher numbers on the entrance exams who were not being admitted in lieu of men. And she thought that was totally unfair. Why aren't you taking the most qualified person? It doesn't matter if it's a man or woman. It is a matter of qualification. Not only unfair to those who are scoring high, but not the most intelligent choice to have the most qualified service. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You want in military, in medical, any medical service, whether civilian, military, you want the best qualified people. Exactly. Uh, yeah. If you're providing training to people who are less qualified, are they going to improve? And you have people who have the acumen, they have the ability, women, why not admit them? That's where, that was her argument. For a while, they were doing under a quota system and there were still women who were being excluded with higher exam scores. Yeah. Today, I think, and it's thanks to her efforts, she actually lobbied the French National Assembly for help in getting this equality, this this equal treatment. Today, I think there are slightly more women, maybe more than half of the women in the French Medical Service de Santé Medical Corps that are women. I think that it's a slight majority of women now in the medical the military medical corps in the French military. Oh, that's, but that's thanks to her yeah. seeing the injustice of that. And it's not, as you say, it's not just the injustice. You want the best qualified people, obviously, oh. and it doesn't matter who they are. If they're qualified and they're, they have superior potentials, you want those people to be you uh, want to en promoted. Yeah, you want to enlist the, all sources of national power in your defense and, and not overlook some because they look, they are because <laughs> of their gender or that's the whole point of a national defense system. Absolutely. No, it's wonderful that she did that work. I do bristle a little bit at my own ladies shying away from the word feminism because the true definition of that is equality. And I think that it has gotten a bad rap over the years because we, we are all of us who believe that in, in using the best and the brightest, no matter what their gender or color, feminism is a part of that too. So good oh, yeah. for, her. It, for her. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it makes absolute sense. It's absolutely and I'm right. so glad to hear that the service honors her in that way, because I just, I think she's an incredible hero just for the world, not just for France. I'm hoping to have my book translated into French and published mm -hmm. in France. So that's my next goal. Because yeah. believe it or not, there are not that many people. I tell this story to people in France all the time. And there are not that many people who are aware of her history. Wow. And my intention is this. <laughs> I've made this offer. If I do get published in France, I do intend to donate the proceeds of this book to a good cause in France. That's been my offer. I don't believe that this story is mine. As I said, I've used quite a bit of her autobiographies to write this book. And, I, and as I said, I do footnote that completely. I do credit her as my primary source. However, th with that in mind, I don't consider this story my story. It's Valerie Andre's story. It's France's story. Mm -hmm. So 
that's my intention of donating the proceeds of this book to a good cause in France. I don't know what that cause is yet. I'm hoping to get good suggestions about that. Yeah. Maybe there are some veterans funds or something that you could support something like that for them. That would be good. I don't know if a a book like this will generate very much. I'm just hoping to promote her story. That's what my intention is more than anything else. I think she's a tremendous figure historically. And I do believe that she should have that recognition. And then we're still can say that we're in her lifetime. Yeah, you know, I know. At 101. Yeah, so incredible. Before we wrap things up, I want to just hear a little bit about the publication of the book. So you knew that you wanted to write the book. You said around 2003, you decided that it was time. And then, so what was the path to getting it in print for you? I wrote my first book years ago, War of the Aeronauts, with a company called Stackpole Books. And a couple summers ago, I was ready. I had the manuscript mostly done, except if the last couple chapters. I had it, I'd say, 95% done so and edited for the most part. And so I knew I had a manuscript ready to go. So I contacted several publishers, and, and I finally got an agent, too. I finally have an agent that works with me named Rita Rosencrantz out of New York. Great. And uh, wanted to have this book in print while Valerie Andre was still with us. I wanted to be able to tell her that after all these years, the tall American, as she calls me, was able <laughs> to finally get this thing done. And uh, I contacted Stackpole Books. It's part of Roman and Littlefield now. And uh, they liked the story. They decided to go with it. And they gave me a fairly good guarantee that the book would be in print in fairly short order. I think I started the process in... Let me think now. I think I've been working. I think I started the process in late 2021 with them and went through last year to do the the final chapters and the final edit. And it came into print in January of this year. So I think they did a very good job in the production of the book. And I, I was happy to be able to get it done, as I say, while Valerie Andre was still with us. Yeah. She was very pleased. The publisher was very kind enough to send copies of the book to her family and to her in France. And, and some of her friends, I was able to put together a list of people I wanted the book preview book, I, including you. I had you on the list as well. And I know you had contacted my publisher yes. and they told me about you. And I was very yeah. pleased that you took an interest in this story. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. And so I was very happy that they were able to get a copy of this book out to Valerie Andre back in January of this year. And I wish I could have got it done sooner. That's my only regret. It took the time it took because I really wanted to do something unique. I didn't want to do something derivative. Uh, If I had done something derivative, I just didn't feel like it was right. And so that's why different aspects of this book came from different, different sources. One more source I have to read for accreditation. I have to recommend, I have to mention this book. This is Rotors Over the Skies of Indochina. This is a three, this is part of a three volume set written by a man named General Michel Florence, and he was a colleague of Valérie André. He was the head of the military flight helicopter training school in France or for the Air Force. And he was a retired general who I got to meet through Valérie André many years ago. It's an interesting story. My French was terrible when I first came to Vietnam, to France in 2003. And, uh, but I speak Italian a little bit better than I speak, a lot better than I speak French. My family's Italian. So General Florence's wife was from Corsica. And when I stumbled in French, I would switch to Italian and she would translate my Italian back into French. And then she would, (laughs) then she would translate French back into Italian for me. I improved in my French over the years, but (laughs) when I first went in 2003, I would say that I was probably in the category of speaking like a baby at the time. I always say that I uh, I speak like a (laughs) three-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I say. So yeah. Io parlo italiano molto più bene than francese. I say to them, I can speak Italian a little bit better than French. That's good. The book, you, it was published in January. Is the publisher doing anything to help you promote it? Or are you out there on your own? And where are you and how are you promoting it? To answer your question, I do have a very good publicist at Roman and Littlefield. Her name is Maura Cahill. And she's very, and I think she's a really top-notch publicist. If I ask her, for help, she'll give it to me. But I don't see this book being reviewed as much. I'm really, I'm really appreciative. I'm really grateful to what you're doing and helping mm-hmm. with this book because, again, I just want Valerie Andre's story out there more than anything else. Yeah. But I haven't seen this book reviewed as much as I'd like to see it. And I, I know the book has been sent out to a lot of different outlets, different magazines that have aviation magazines, 
military mm-hmm. history magazines. But right. yeah, I think in a lot of ways, I've been, I have been trying to do a lot on my own to help promote this book. I was recently, mm-hmm. as I said, in, in France, and I visited a number of bookshops that cater to English books, English language books. And I'm trying to get some interest in having it carried over there. But more importantly, I'm trying to get it carried here in the United States. I noticed that my local Barnes & Noble in Reno actually carried the book on their shelves. So that's encouraging. Maybe it means other Barnes & Noble outlets in the United States are carrying the book. So I hope that's true. Yeah. And I haven't seen the sales results yet. Coming, They'll come up in a couple more weeks. I think I get a statement in June. But I noticed that in the preliminary sales statement, they said they, they've sold about 400 books from the time period. They tell me it's from July to January of, of, of or end of December of 2022. Okay. So that's encouraging. Yeah, that but is. I, yeah, but I'm working on trying to get it out, the word out there. And I'm, any suggestions that come my way, I'll definitely pursue. Okay. We'll make sure that we, I do my part oh, in, no, in my I, little like said, niche totally world. Are you anywhere on social media? I have a Facebook page. I'm terrible at social media. I've been doing, getting a little bit more active with Facebook uh, yep. grudgingly because I'm not a big fan of Facebook, but on the other hand, yep. I know it's one of these things you have to do these days. Yeah. I think I have a thing on Twitter, but I haven't used it. I don't really yeah. know how to. Yeah. If you don't, if you, here's just my advice. I've been experimenting with all of this stuff for the past couple of years. And if you haven't figured Twitter out and you don't want to figure Twitter out, then don't. Okay. <laughs> Some That's people it. love it. I've been messing around, like I said, across social media and I haven't figured Twitter out. So I just don't okay. spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> that makes me feel better. Thanks. Yeah. But in, on Facebook, I just want you to know that I post about your stuff, not just in the Aviatrix Book Club where we have about 2,000 members, but also oh, there's wow. some other aviation book clubs where I've already posted about it and I'll post the interview there. So it'll reach oh, the guys too. Hopefully they'll pick it up and read it. Oh, no, um, I think it's universal. I think it's an inspiration. Her story is an inspiration for everyone. That's what I think. I'm really, I'll really be happy if women and young women, especially read this story, are inspired by her. By Valerie yeah. Andre, but I think it's her story is, is universal. Absolutely, and fascinating on the historical side as well, like universities or whatever classes that are teaching this period of history. Hopefully, it'll contribute something to those people who are interested in this part of history too. Wonderful. Is there anything that we didn't have a chance to talk about that you would like to say? I didn't get into her, her history about in Algeria, but I guess that's something that you could read about in the book if you get a hold of it. Why don't you quickly sum that up? Because you're right. We didn't cover that whole period, which is a huge part of her career as well. Yeah. After the after her, after her she left Vietnam, she left in 1953. And I think there are some blurbs out there that say that she took part at Dien Bien Phu, which is not correct. One of her colleagues did. And I write about him in my book because, you know, his story is rather Yeah, she was well. back in France. She was back in France yeah. by the time in 1953, in 1954, when Dinh Dinh Phu, Phu uh, happened. And that yeah. was the French defeat in Vietnam and Indochina. So that was the end of the French involvement there. And she continued on in as, as much as she could. She felt like she was rudderless for a while, but she took up a position at a, a flight test center in, in France. And she got to meet Jacqueline Oriol, uh, who was yeah. the daughter-in-law of the French president at the time. But more importantly, she was the first one of the, along with Jacqueline Cochran, I believe, yes. the first uh, yes, woman to break the sound barrier. Yeah, there was this this competition between both of them. I was going to mention that. Yeah. And so she became very good friends with Jacqueline Oriel. And, but she was always really wanting to get back into the military aspects of things. <laughs> and she had a lot of supporters by this time. She had proven her capabilities. They knew that she was, she might have been. Petite. She's only about five foot two, weighs roughly 95, 100 pounds. She has incredible tenacity. I think if anything you can, one word can sum her up, tenacity, because she doesn't back down from anything. I love to talk and, about how our books represent vast collection of tenacity, adventure, and courage. There you go. And courage, yeah. she has in abundance as well. To right, con- yeah. Courage, tenacity. She never gives up. And uh, anyway, she, uh, through her contacts in the French Air Force by this time, and I must emphasize, she was always French Army, right. but they made an exemption for her. And uh, she came back, she went on one of her military leaves, she went to Algeria 
to I, to see the helicopter, how the helicopter service had expanded by this time in Algeria. Algeria is actually concerned one of the first helicopter wars. I know that the helicopter was used extensively in Vietnam during the U.S. Vietnam War, but Algeria is where the it became the test bed for helicopters. And by this time, it wasn't just the little fragile Hiller helicopters or or even Bell 47s by this time, they've gone into things like the Sikorsky, the, the large okay. Sikorsky helicopters for both medical rescue and troop transport. Valerie Andre had, a, and also for, for gunships too, French had developed the Sikorsky helicopters into gunships as well. So Valerie Andre got a chance to see that. I think she went in 1957, but she lobbied hard to go back to, to Algeria in 1959. And then she was assigned to a military helicopter squadron that not only practiced medical rescue, she was also involved in troop transport. They would actually ferry troops to the battlefields that they needed to fight the FLN, the liberation movement that was trying to gain control over Algeria. And she was also in Algeria and she flew lots and lots of hours. In fact, at one time got stranded in the desert after she was bringing feed to some camels for a camel cavalry unit. But... She was also involved in Algeria when the General's Revolt happened, and uh, and this is when there was an attempt at a revolution in France by a group of generals who were opposed to how Charles de Gaulle by this time was conducting the war in Algeria. And it's a really fascinating history about that as well. Charles de Gaulle was brought back as president of France partially because he was pro-colonialist initially on, but he saw that uh, there was no point in trying to commit more lives to to trying to save Algeria. It was going to be the same situation that the French exper experienced in Indochina. And early on, he started to make overtures to the liberation movement in Algeria to, again, as I suggested, the possibility in Indochina was maybe France could maintain its economic interest in Algeria, but allow the Algerians to run Algeria for itself. But that has upset many what they called pied noir the black, the the Europeans, primarily French, who were born in Algeria over the last century, prior to 1960, mm -hmm. that felt that they should control the economic interests of Algeria, and that was a conflict that the mm -hmm. the Europeans who settled there as colonialists felt that they had the right to control Algeria over the Algerians, and the Algerians did not feel the same way, obviously, and that was right. the conflict that eventually drove France and the Europeans who had been there for close to a century by that time, out of Algeria by 1961. But it's right. an interesting story. Uh, Valerie Andre saw that history. She actually saw how these paramilitary groups uh, that were formed under these re these generals who revolted against de Gaulle's rule at the time, his, his presidency. She saw how some of these uh, paramilitary groups within the French military were uh, trying to seek control over the military situation in Algeria. And for, unfortunately for these people who were involved in the revolt, the military remained loyal to de Gaulle at the time. The majority yeah. of the military remained loyal, but there were quite a bit of an insurrection at the time. It, would, it, it numbered in, in, into the thousands and de Gaulle was the subject of many assassination attempts from at that time. He eventually pardoned everybody, which is also remarkable about how he conducted his presidency during that time period. There's a lot of controversy about Charles de Gaulle, but I think there's one thing that you could say about him. Unwaveringly, he was for France. He did believe in France and he did believe in the best interest for France. He didn't, that didn't necessarily mean the best interests of his allies like the United States at the time, but he did believe in France. And I think he was somebody that I know Valerie Andre admired quite a bit. Again, you bring that history to life for me in the way that you did uh, by giving me the lens of Valerie Andre and her accomplishments. We, you said, I think over or almost 500 combat missions Yes, in her career. In combat area. Yeah. There's a distinction between being a, an offensive combatant. She was more in the, okay. she was in the know, line of fire mode or transport yeah. mode, but no, it d definitely into dangerous areas, dangerous combat zones. Right. That's absolutely right. no question there. Yeah. And we didn't even talk about it, but I absolutely, love, I just want to say this. I absolutely loved, like you got me with that story that you used to open the book, an incredible story of her trying to deal with a patient who wakes up 
and is was not expecting to be in the air. That was definitely a white knuckle story. So everybody needs to go get the book so that they can read that. And Charles, thank you so much for your time and for not, I'm thanking you for your time right now, but I'm thanking you too for your time, all of the time that you, from the moment that you saw that picture and you found, you found some spark of interest there, that spark of inspiration and wanted to know more to all of the time that you invested to create this story and bring it to us in a way that we can digest it and learn from it. Thank you so much for preserving that history. Oh, definitely. Thank you, Liz. And thank you for this opportunity to be on your program today. And yes, thank you. And I'm glad, I just, as I said, I just really want to get her story out there and more people to know who she was and what she accomplished in her career. Absolutely. And we'll do our best to amplify that for you too. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Shasta Ways and Michael Wilds of the Women's Soar Group for their assistance in producing this interview. The Women's Soar Group is a media company that gives women a platform to express themselves. Blue skies and happy reading. Thank you for listening and thank you coming home well for your collaboration in helping these stories reach a broader audience. Writing is a deeply healing and cathartic exercise. It can help you process your experiences, whether you intend to share them with the world or keep them to yourself. Living the experiences of others through reading can also help heal, validate, and create a sense of connectedness. If you're interested in hearing about how these authors brought their stories to life on the page, check out the Writer's Room interviews on the Aviatrix book review website and podcast. If you'd like to join the book club conversations, look for the Aviatrix Book Club on Facebook. All are welcome. And connect with me on social media at Literary Aviatrix. I'd love to hear from you. Blue skies and happy reading. Mm-hmm.